I spotted my favorite fluffy white goose at the park today, nibbling on a slice of bread that someone else had tossed for him. So I decided that this was a good opportunity to pet him while he was busy, or maybe even give him a hug. After kneeling down and showing him my hands so that he wouldn't feel threatened, I made sure not to make any sudden moves, giving him a chance to get used to me first. It was at this point when a shirtless man spotted me near the goose and just wanted to make sure that I wasn't feeding him bread. After assuring him that I only wanted to film a selfie of myself petting him, I asked him, since he was out here flexing his muscles, if he was brave enough to do it first. I guess he was a tough guy after all. While this goose definitely has an independent streak, he's a very loving animal and is not as violent as some of the other geese that frequent this lake. I still didn't pet him, but I think now he knows me a bit and feels more comfortable, so we'll see how it goes next time. I'm gonna put it on uh, YouTube. Oh, there's so many of He's a, he's a okay. celebrity, this guy. Yeah, I know. <laughs> very well known in the park. <laughs> very well known in the park. For now, I think I'll head over to the beach and we can start today's episode. Looking out at the ocean, I'm reminded of the ancient seafaring civilizations that are documented and preserved in our recorded history. And then, can't help but ponder the multitude of undocumented civilizations that have come and gone, many not leaving behind a single trace for their existence, except maybe for an occasional brief mention in an obscure mythology of antiquity. There's probably no better example than the Sea People, the name given to a mysterious confederacy of naval raiders that invaded the coastal towns and cities of the Mediterranean region a little over 3,000 years ago, concentrating their efforts especially on Egypt. They're considered one of the major contributing causes to the Bronze Age collapse, and as far as academia is concerned, their origin and nationality remains a mystery. The existing records of their activities are mainly Egyptian sources who only describe them in terms of battle, such as the record from the Stele at Tanis, which reads, quote, they came from the sea in their warships and none could stand against them. The sea people came sweeping across the Mediterranean, wreaking havoc and creating chaos leaving smoking ruins and destroyed cities in their wake, and to them is attributed the collapse of the Hittite Empire, the downfall of Cyprus, the destruction of Syrio-Palestinian and Canaanite kingdoms, and perhaps even the demise of the Mycenaeans and the Minoans. Of course, it should be noted that these attacks followed one of the most devastating natural disasters to affect the entire Mediterranean, during the Holocene, which was the eruption of Santorini on the island of Crete about 3,600 years ago, which at the very least weakened all of these civilizations that I just mentioned, disrupting agriculture with all of its dust and ash, and may have been part of the calamities mentioned in the Bible leading up to the time of the Exodus. No ancient inscription names the coalition as Sea Peoples, this is a modern-day designation coined by anthropologists because the ancient reports claim that these tribes came from the sea or from the islands, but they never say which sea or which islands, 
and so the Sea People's origin remains debated. Three pharaohs recorded their conflicts with the Sea Peoples, including Ramesses II, also called Ramesses the Great, and his son and successor, Merenptah, who both claimed great victories, leaving behind inscriptions that provide the most detailed evidence of the Sea Peoples. That said, it was during the reign of the pharaoh Ramesses III that the Sea Peoples attacked and destroyed the Egyptian trading center at Kadesh, and then again attempted a massive invasion of Egypt. They began their activities with quick raids along the coast, as they had done during the time of Ramesses II, before driving for the Delta. Ramesses III defeated them in 1180 BC, but they returned in force. In his own victory inscription, Ramesses III described their invasion, quote, The foreign countries conspired in their islands. All at once the lands were removed and scattered in the fray. No land could resist their arms, from Hatti, Kod, Karchemish, Azawa, and Alesa, on being cut off at a time. A camp was set up in Amaru. They desolated its people, and its land was like that which had never existed. They were coming forward towards Egypt, while the flame was prepared for them. Their confederation was the Peleset, Jeker, Shekelesh, Denin, and Weshesh, lands united. They laid their hands upon the lands as far as the circuit of the earth. Their hearts were confident and trusting, as they said, Our plans will succeed. The Sea Peoples described and listed by the Egyptians were a coalition of Bronze Age Greeks, such as the Ekwesh, who the Hittites referred to as Achaeans, identified by the poet Homer as the Greeks who besieged Troy, who many archaeologists have identified with the Mycenaeans, the first Greeks, or rather, the first people to speak the Greek language. Then there are the Tyrrhenians, who are a non-Greek people who some historians identify with the Etruscans of ancient Italy that were eventually assimilated into Roman society, comprising some of their earliest kings. They were largely regarded as pirates, at least by their enemies. They did not call themselves Etruscan, but rather refer to themselves as Rasana, meaning the people, also the Rutuli, or the red ones, or blonde ones. Incidentally, the term Phoenician also means red, but I'll get to that later on. The Rutuli were located in a territory whose capital was located about 20 miles southeast of Rome. According to Homer, quote, Presently there came swiftly over the sparkling sea Tarsinian pirates on a well-decked ship. A miserable doom led them on. So, according to Homer, they were regarded as pirates, as were the Phoenicians and Vikings, also seafaring populations, which incidentally shared nearly identical vessels, likewise affiliated with the term red. Also identified by Ramesses III were the Luca, a thriving maritime people of western Anatolia, also known from Hittite sources as Lycia, speakers of the Luwian language group, a branch of the Indo-European or Aryan languages. The Sheridan, or Sardinians, were also listed by the Egyptians, and who Herodotus referred to as pirates and mercenaries. I've already discussed their link to the tribe of Dan in prior videos, and a recent genetic study on ancient DNA from Sardinia reveals a high level of relatedness, and that the island has one of the highest rates of people who live to 100 years or more. And Peliset generally believed to refer to the Philistines, who were the only major tribe of sea people to settle permanently in Palestine in the 12th century BC, about the time of the arrival of the Israelites. The Bible says they came from Kaftor, which is in some way affiliated with Egypt. While some claim that they might have come from Crete, there is no real archaeological evidence of a Philistine occupation of the island. The representatives in the Bible include the giant Goliath, who was defeated by the future king David, and Delilah, who robbed the Israelite Samson of his strength by cutting his hair. 
In a prior presentation, I discussed how not cutting hair or shaving was symbolic for a vow of celibacy, or actually chastity, the difference being that the full climax was not externalized in an effort to harness and amplify one's life force energy, which was the source of Samson's power. And the act of cutting his hair was symbolic of him having a sexual mishap, much in the same way as eating the forbidden fruit in the story of the Garden of Eden. The Philistine reputation was of a hostile, warlike, and hedonistic tribe that indulged in pagan orgies, sex magic, and sacrifice. According to the Bible, Dagon was the national god of the Philistines, who was the father of Baal. Dagon was the Hebrew word for grain, so he was linked to agriculture, fertility, and inventor of the plow. Many people are aware that there was human sacrifice made to the god Baal and believe this to be some rare, obscure desert cult, when in fact Baal is just a title that means Lord and was a thunder god, essentially the same deity as the Greek Zeus, the Roman Jupiter, the Scandinavian or Germanic Thor, the Babylonian god Marduk, and the Hindu god Indra. All of these deities are associated with the planet Jupiter, which traverses the ecliptic at night over its 12-year orbit around the sun, passing through each of the 12 houses of the zodiac. Ecliptic refers to the sun's apparent path during the year, and so, in this context, Jupiter represents a solar cult, where the sun and other planets are symbolic of light, which is really what is being revered light representing spiritual knowledge or gnosis. So the ancients were not worshiping the bull, but worshiping a solar age where the sun spends roughly 2000 years associated with one of the 12 astrological houses, which during the time of the sea people was Taurus as part of its 26,000 year procession. As for Jupiter, Zeus or Baal, the king of the gods, it traverses the zodiac, which is expressed as the 12 labors of Samson or Hercules, who also had 12 labors, the 12 knights of the round table, the 12 Buddhist stations of life, the 12 sons of Odin. The Jews had the 12 sons of Jacob, which went on to become the 12 tribes of Israel. The Christians have the 12 disciples of Christ, the same number of disciples as Mithras the Greeks with their 12 gods on Mount Olympus. There are 12 inches in a foot, 12 eggs in a dozen. And Shia Muslims list 12 ruling imams following Muhammad. Such holy persons are often depicted with a bright solar light around their heads. And many ancient religions, such as the Gnostics, understood things like the 12 disciples of Mithras to be symbolic of the mysteries, which has been occluded in modern times by a veneer of superstition and a covert political agenda. In prior videos about alchemy, I've already discussed the significance of the numbers three and four, representing male and female respectively, which added together makes seven and represents creation and will be associated with sex energy, such as concerning the seven chakras in the human body which correspond to the seven gods, or planets, including the sun and the moon. The number 12 is three times four, which Pythagoras taught had profound mystical meaning. In the Kabbalistic perspective, the universe is a cube, which is comprised of 12 lines, and even the revered solar symbol utilized by the National Socialist is comprised of 12 parts. There's a lot of esoteric or occult material concerning the numbers 12, 7, and 3 that are reflected in the Hebrew alphabet itself, which incidentally shares a root with the Phoenicians. But let's focus today on astrotheology. Astro means stars, and theology means religion, which was vital to any seafaring civilization because the stars are how they were able to navigate at night bringing us back to the sea people. 
While we know that they were collectively part of a coalition of people from various islands of the Mediterranean, oftentimes regarded as pirates and associated with the color red, they all share genetic and cultural affinities with a demographic which has been left out of the historical record, which also applied red ochre paint to their skin and did not originate in the Mediterranean, but navigated the ocean to invade it. I've already mentioned that the pre-colonial Americas were populated by the same racial diversity as the Old World, meaning the same variation of blood types, different language groups, and different haplogroups, including haplogroup X, which, according to this chart, populated both sides of the Atlantic since antiquity, particularly the eastern portion of the Americas and the eastern Mediterranean, where ancient Phoenicia, or modern Israel, is located. Modern academia struggles to explain where all of the copper came from that fueled the Bronze Age in the Old World, and it also cannot account for all of the missing copper that was mined in Michigan, as there's not enough Native American copper artifacts to account for it. It's clear that transatlantic trade has been ongoing the entire duration of the Holocene, which I propose is the true origin of the mysterious sea people that invaded the Mediterranean. That said, the Bronze Age collapse attack on Egypt was not the first time as one needs only to turn to the Egyptians themselves, via Plato, to see how far back this war really goes. Quote, Many great and wonderful deeds are recorded of your state in our histories, but one of them exceeds all the rest in greatness and valor. This vast power endeavor to subdue out of blow our country and yours and the whole of the region within the straits, and then your country shone forth in the excellence of her virtue and strength among all mankind. She was preeminent in courage and military skill and was the leader of the Hellenes. And when the rest fell off from her, being compelled to stand alone, having undergone the very extremity of danger, she defeated and triumphed over the invaders and preserved from slavery those not yet subjugated and generously liberated all the rest who dwell within the pillars. There will be many in the mainstream most with no academic credentials in anthropology, that reject my conclusions, claiming that Atlantis was fiction and that pre-Columbian transatlantic seafaring civilizations in antiquity is wild speculation. And to them, I say that the genetic and archeological record have conclusively demonstrated to me that politically motivated Afrocentrism is what is fiction and that the out of Africa hypothesis is what is obsolete, wild, speculative imagination. Europe and the Americas were not populated by magically mutating sub-Saharan populations 35,000 years ago, but rather by a non-African demographic arising from Cro-Magnon types somewhere in the Atlantic, likely around the Azores, which introduced and disseminated agricultural civilization, domesticated animals, metals, writing, and the basis for all world religions to the rest of the world becoming its nobility, starting during the Pleistocene and continuing into the Holocene. That said, I decided to make a quick stop at Shamshiri in Westwood, which means sword in Farsi and is one of the few places where one can find authentic Persian ice cream, which, if you haven't tried yet, is a must. The one on the left is made from milk, eggs, sugar, rose water, saffron, vanilla, and pistachios, and the one on the right is similar to sorbet, consisting of thin noodles 
in a semi-frozen syrup containing rose water and make sure to squeeze some lemon or lime on it. You will love this stuff. My name is Robert Sepper. I'm an anthropologist. My published work is available on Amazon and through all other major book outlets. If you'd like to support my work, you can do that through patreon.com. There should be a link in the description. Please subscribe for future updates. Leave your thoughts below. Have a wonderful weekend, and I hope to see you again soon.